Hi, it's Ryan from Nights Around a Table, and you're about to see me plummet to the very depths of despair as I desperately tried a 3D printed insert for key flower, right now on Bits Please. Bits Please! This one's gonna be a bit of a ride. Hopefully you've been following the series and you saw my last episode of Bits Please with the Lost Ruins of Arnak insert, an absolutely fantastic production that I printed. I actually bought a printer to print it. I was really happy with it when I was finished. But for a lot of you, that might have been a bit, I mean, I'm a bit much sometimes, I understand. That might have been kind of like, yeah, all right, go effort boy, but I'm really kind of like, I, I don't really want to put that much time or effort into the stuff that I do in this one life that God has given me. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to rein it back in. I'm going to keep it a little bit more subdued or so I thought uh, with this one. All I'm going to do with this one, we're just going to print an insert because when I asked you to tell me in the comments of previous videos, what you would do if you were in possession of a 3D printer, whether FDM or SLA, and we saw the difference in previous episodes, what would you do with it? And a lot of you just said, well, I would just take all my games that needed inserts and I would simply print inserts for them. So that's what I thought I would do with this episode. Take a game that desperately needs an insert, key flower, and make the insert for it. But first, let's define the problem. Why does key flower need an insert? Let me show you. Here is the game with its top off. Right off the top, you've got some instruction manuals and some of these uh, flat player screens. I've got a couple of instructions for promos under here. And then this is it. There is no insert to speak of. And we caught my recent Find the Fun video on Keyflower. That's one of the things I griped about in a major way. It would be one thing if the game was easy to set up and tear down, but this game ain't that game. There's no board in the game. It's all just tiles and the tiles go out and they kind of create the, the board. You bid on the tiles and you put them in your own little farms. Fine. All of the tiles are marked with an icon indicating which season they're from. So you see, I've got like the winter bag and I've got the, the, that's a homes bag. Hold on. I've got a spring bag here, right? So they have, it's hard to see because it's green on green. So there's the tile and there's the spring icon in the top left of the tile. But maddeningly, when you turn the tile over and they do get flipped during gameplay, there is no corresponding symbol. So on one side it says spring and the other side it doesn't say spring and you need to know but from both sides that this thing says spring. Not only that, but it, you, you, have to, you have to split the tiles into seasons and you have to put them out according to how many players you have. And how many tiles is it per player per season? Well, the number changes depending on the season and depending on the number of players. So you have to go and you got to get the rule book out and you got to find the page in the rule book. I think it's page, yes, it's page two. So you got to open it up and look at this little chart. And that was a pain in the butt. So just to try to make this thing a little bit easier to set up, I did this. I got the old Brother P-Touch label maker out and I put labels on the winter bag. This is the first bag you have to deal with. I, and I, I wrote, okay, so for two players, you need two boats. For five players, you need five boats, six boats. For six players, you need four turn tiles. And three players, you need seven seasonal tiles, but eight if you're doing a four, you know, and so on. It's just like, oh my gosh. I put that all on the bag to make it easier. And then I have a cat named Pippin who likes to chew plastic bags. So he very helpfully put a couple of holes in this bag. Beyond that, you've got not only the seasonal tiles, but you've got ones that represent the homes of the players. You've got ones that are for boats. You've got tiles that are for player order. And these ones are really frustrating. Sorry, no, it's not these ones. It's the boats that are really frustrating because the boats occupy multiple seasons. So there's the spring icon, but this boat comes out in fall. This one comes out in spring and summer. It's a headache. It's probably one of the worst games in my collection to set up. Like, look at this. You've got a whole separate bag for green keeples because they got to be split up. And then you've got this big, whoa-oh, draw bag and all the meeples are coming out of it because it tipped upside down in here. And then you've got this bag full of cardboard tiles that can tip upside down. And then I have, you know, there are two expansions for the game. One's called the farmers and one's called the merchants. Uh, those are the two bigger expansions. So you've got extra baggies of these things and these are supposed to be stacked in piles of three piles and, and these things which are supposed to come out in a certain ordered array and all these resources are three different kinds that got to be separated. You got three different kinds of livestock that have to be separated and then you've got 
tiles in certain seasons for the expansion games as well. It is, it's the, it's the worst. It's the, it's the flipping worst. I hate it. And I think it has contributed to me not playing this game as often as I think I would like to because I quite enjoy this game. You watched my Find the Fun video. The verdict of the scales of Funstus was in and the game is fun. The game is fun. Setup and teardown are tortuous. So we need an insert for it. What are our options? Well, we can design our own inserts or we can go looking for one. And if we go looking for one, we're keeping our fingers crossed that we find somebody who's designed one that fits not just the base game, but all the expansions. And then the holy grail is that the, the insert does everything in the same box, all expansions. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Well, okay, off we go to Thingiverse, which you've seen from past episodes is a website where people design things in 3D and they're offered for free. You can download them and try to print them out. So this is the first one that caught my eye and it would not normally have if I hadn't done that Lost Ruins of Arnak video, where the designer just had the, the cover of the game as the first image. But as soon as you dive in, you go to the second image, oh my gosh, this guy has like a 3D exploded view of how all the different compartments fit into this insert. That's fantastic. And as I clicked through, I noticed everything fit in the same box. And I really, I really wondered what the colors were all about because it's just a beautiful looking colorful insert. Well, look, what the designer Hybrid Tracer has done is used different colors to indicate not only which pieces come from which expansions, if anything that you see that's brown is from the merchant's expansion, and anything that you see that's pink is from the farmer's expansion, but he, presumably he, I'm just taking a wild guess, has also made it so that the seasonal boxes that hold the tiles are color coded so that you can see at a glance which box is for spring, which one's for summer, which one's for fall, and which one's for winter. Just left that one white or used PLA to print that in white. It's gorgeous. It fits all three expansions in the same box. It's colorful, it's beautiful, it looks amazing. I desperately want to print this insert, but I want it to look as good as it does in the picture, which means I want my components to be different colors too. The problem though, is that PLA, the plastic that you run through these 3D printers, isn't the cheapest substance in the world. So let's count up all the different colors that Hybrid Tracer has used in this insert. Understanding that a decent roll of PLA costs about 42 Canuck bucks. So we've got light blue, that's just the base game color. We've got green for spring, yellow for summer, orange for fall, white for winter, which we can get away with if we do the rest in white, although he's done the rest of the thing in gray, the pieces that are supposed to stay in the box and not move. He's used pink for the farmer's expansion, brown for the merchant's expansion, and he has a separate color for this piece that houses the green meeples and the, and the special purple meeple for the end of the game. I don't quite understand why, because I think that could easily be done in the same light blue color that he has the other base game components in. So even if we keep conservative and we use the winter white for the stationary pieces instead of having white and gray pieces. And we use the same color of blue for those other two compartments. We're still looking at six different colors of PLA, so six rolls of 42 bucks. That's 252 Canuck bucks to print this insert for Keyflower. And I say, nuts to that. <laughs> I'm not spending that kind of money. I'm not spending, you know, triple or quadruple what I paid to actually buy the game. So it's possible, and I can't really tell from the pictures, that Designer Hybrid Tracer spray painted these pieces instead of printing them out in their own PLA color rolls. So if that's the case, let's look up what a can of spray paint costs. So if I shop here at homedepot.ca, I can see that a can of Rust-Oleum paint, like automotive spray paint, costs $8.48 Canuck bucks. Multiply that by the six colors I need, and that's 50 bucks and 88 cents. Still quite expensive if you don't have any of that spray paint kicking around. Plus the cost of a roll of white PLA, and that's 42 bucks. Hopefully you can get it all done in one roll. <laughs> My sweet summer child. Now it's gonna be pretty much 100 bucks without tax to print this entire insert. That I'll admit is a spicy meatball. Plus you gotta factor in the cost of the 3D printer that you've purchased and then all the time because this stuff doesn't just shoot out of there like a paper printer. So it's a commitment for sure. And you could probably get away with paying less if you were gonna go with one of these guys who makes a wood insert or a foam core insert for sure. But does anybody make a wood or foam core insert for Keyflower? I'm not too sure, I haven't looked into it. And would the wood or foam core insert look, frankly, as nice as this beautiful plastic and spray painted insert? I don't know, I have my doubts about that. So in the spirit of showing you what's possible, just before the third lockdown in Ontario hit, 
My wife Cheryl woke me up out of bed. She said, ah, we gotta go buy craft supplies. They're shutting down all non-essential services. And in my delirium, I said, no, crafts, crafts are essential. I'm gonna go back to bed. She said, no, they're not. She dragged me out of bed. And we, we raced out to Home Depot and I bought all of the spray paints that I would need for this project and for a few future Bits Please projects for you to enjoy. So armed, I returned home and set about printing the key flower insert. If you're digging this story so far, remember to click three very important buttons. One says thumb, one says subscribe, and the other is look a little bell. It'll tell you when I've gotten new stuff. So I do one of these episodes of Bits Please every single month. If you click those buttons, you're gonna get notified when new ones come up. I've also got a how to play videos and find the fun videos, all kinds of board game content to keep you and your loved ones entertained. And if you think I'm doing something important or valuable here and making your life a little bit better with this stuff, throw me a buck or two or more on Patreon. I am going to start designing custom bits for board games according to popular demand, and I hope to make those available on the Patreon campaign. So if you're getting into the ground floor, you'll be able to see that content roll in as perks in the near future. So back to this. When you get 3D files from a place like Thingiverse and you wanna run them through a 3D printer, you can't, it's not just like a paper printer where you say, go and it cranks it out. You know, even with paper printers, you might have to adjust the resolution or the cropping, the framing or whatever. It's a little bit more involved with a 3D printer. You have to use a piece of software called a slicer. Many are free, some are not. But what the slicer does is it takes the 3D model and according to the parameters you set, it carves it up into layers that the stylus can then extrude plastic into. And you know, you've seen it work, how it builds up those layers. This is the slicing software I use. It's a free piece of software called Cura. And one of the first things I do when I wanna print a 3D insert from Thingiverse is I open up each piece and make sure that it's gonna fit on the bed. And each printer that you buy has a different build volume. So as long as you tell Cura which printer you're using, it'll show this grid showing the build volume of that printer. And check this out, these two pieces, this piece that holds all of the different trays and I think the shields, and this piece that holds a couple of pieces alongside, those are the gray bits that remain stationary in the box. Those are way too big to fit on my printer bed. So I was gonna have to cut these down. I thought the solution was just slice them using 3D software and print them as separate components. The 3D software I decided to use is called Blender. It's a free piece of 3D software. And I'm at a bit of an advantage here because I went to school for 3D animation and design. So Blender's tough, but it's not the worst thing in the world for me to try to fumble my way around in it. I'm gonna show you quickly the process that I went through to get these pieces cut up into separate boxes with the caveat that there may be a much easier way to do this. If there is, I don't know what it is. If you know, please leave a comment below and maybe you can save me some time on a project in the future. But here's how I did it. All right, so here I've imported the box into Blender and I select it and I hit tab and that takes me into edit mesh mode. Now you can see there's a whole bunch of extraneous faces in here that I don't really want. So the first thing I like to do is to go and choose this option. Mesh, clean up, limited dissolve, and that takes away some of the unnecessary triangles, so it's a lot cleaner to work with. Then I use uh, the K key to choose the knife tool, and that lets me just go around and click on these edges and draw sort of like a cut line. It's a really sloppy cut line, but that doesn't matter because I'm going to clean it up in just a second. So I rotate the box while I'm doing this, and I click, and I hopefully stick the landing here. And I hit space, and there's the whole cut line. Now, none of those vertices are aligned properly. So you can select one and tell the 3D cursor to, well, here's me lining it up perfectly. Now we tell the 3D cursor to go where that vertex is. And then if I rotate the model and select all the other sloppy vertices along the cut line, like so, oh, I notice here that these two are not welded. So I actually have auto merge turned on so that when I hold down the control and I drop a vertex on top of another vertex, they merge. So I'm going to select all the vertices on the outside on that cut line. And then I'm going to align all those vertices. I'm sort of going to scale them along the X axis and they all line up because I've got my 3D cursor chosen as the thing that they're lining up to. So, look pretty good. Now I'm going to select that whole section of the box that I want to be its own thing. Select all the vertices, and I'm actually going to Alt-D and duplicate, or sorry, Shift-D and duplicate it. And then I delete these ones, and I'll show you why in just a second. So that those shared vertices are in both objects. Now this is still the same object, so what I have to do is select all these vertices and hit the P key, and that makes it its own thing. So now, see, I've got two different things. But the last problem that you might notice is that there's a face missing on the edge of each of them. 
So I have to select all the edges here and then hit F to make a face. And then over on this one, select it, hit tab, select all the edges here and hit F and make a face. And now when we go back out, look at that, they're beautiful. And so the last step is just to select each one and export it as its own STL file that I can bring into my slicer. There are roughly, I haven't counted, but I think it's a bazillion different sliders and dials and numbers that you can possibly tweak adjusting all these settings in the slicer software to get exactly what you want out of the printer. And since I'm pretty new, I barely understand any of them. But one that I wanted to talk to you about is the infill setting. And this is a pretty basic one. The thought is that if you print a piece out of your 3D printer and you make it completely solid with plastic, you're potentially gonna waste a whole lot of plastic doing that. And like I mentioned, the PLA ain't cheap. So one of the settings is infill, and what it does is it hollows out your model, and instead of making it solid, the stylus draws sort of a lattice work of plastic inside the model. And with all that empty space inside, it makes the model a little bit lighter and uses a whole lot less material. And it's fine, but one of the things that I notice, and it's probably because I don't know how to adjust the other settings properly, but I can kind of see the lattice work in through the walls. And I don't like that. I don't think it looks very good at all. I also find that, again, it might be a wall thickness setting that I'm not adjusting properly, but sometimes it'll take a, a wall, and if the wall thickness is, say, one millimeter, and the wall I'm printing is 1.2 millimeters, it'll think, whoa, well, that's a solid shape, and I should do infill inside it. And then you get this, it's trying to print lattice work inside the wall, and it results in like a really crummy, kind of Swiss cheesy wall where you can see a lot of gaps and lines and maybe some infill pattern. I don't like it. So I experimented with printing these boxes for the Keyflower insert with zero infill, so completely solid. I did it accidentally at first. The piece came off the printer, and I think this is one of the first ones I ever printed. And I was struck with, I was like, whoops, I, I forgot to put infill on, but I was struck with how beautifully uh, dense and solid this piece felt. And I thought, ooh, that's, I mean, it's sinful and it's, it's costly, but it feels so good. And then I kind of went ahead and printed a bunch of the other boxes in the insert with 0% infill and nice and solid. I didn't think it was such a big deal with these seasonal boxes because look, all that's going on here is you've got four thin walls and the only solid part is maybe little triangles down here where there's a little bit of a, a ramp, an angle for those key flower, you know, hexagonal tiles to slot into. So I thought I was safe to go and print the rest of these. Was there zero percent infill. Now one of the problems I got while I was printing, which you can see really clearly in this picture, is that at the corners of the bed, the bed is the the mat that sits on the on like a big metal platform, they started curling up. So the first bunch of layers would print perfectly and beautifully and flat, but as it started printing the walls of the pieces, I would notice that corner, and it was always the front right corner, would just kind of start lifting and raising. And I was like, why is it doing this? Well, that's another setting that you can adjust in your slicer software. You've got a few different options. One of them is skirt, which just kind of prints an outline around the thing that it's going to run off. And that's that gives you sort of a sense of the dimensions of it, which is good for you. But for the printer, it also gives the printer sort of a trial run of just extruding some plastic and trying to get it to stick to your bed before it goes and prints the whole thing. But I printed all of these pieces with skirts. And the problem with skirts, like I get that corner lift, that's one huge problem. And another problem is that it, it was just it was squishing out the PLA so darn thin that you can see it in this picture right here. It was, I couldn't get my fingernail under it to peel it off. It was almost like it was painting the plastic onto the bed. The solution is to not print with a skirt, but to print with one of these things. It's called a raft. So the printer lays down like a bed of plastic because PLA adheres very well to itself. This is the very last box I printed in the entire project, so we're jumping ahead a little bit here. I knew that printing rafts was a good solution to fixing that corner peel. I didn't want to do it because it added extra time and extra material, but I was being really stubborn. After I started printing with rafts, I had much better results. And what's that fancy looking bed, you ask? <laughs> well, I'll get into that in just a second. Now, feeling pretty cocky and confident after printing out all those seasonal boxes, the tile holders, I thought, well, oh, that's a pretty important box, the big one that holds all the trays that have all the components in it. So I'm gonna try printing that one next. And that's where my problems began. 
See, one of the things you have to do with these 3D printers is you have to level the bed. There are screws underneath, at least in my model, that you have to twist one way or the other to raise and lower the bed so that it's a certain distance from the nozzle. And what's that distance supposed to be? About like a fraction of a millimeter. And it has to be evenly a fraction of a millimeter and the same fraction of that millimeter on all four corners. You level one corner at a time. And you do it by sliding a piece of paper between your bed and the nozzle and keep on twisting and adjusting those dials until you can pull the paper and there's resistance. But if you try to push it, it crumples or crinkles. It's very annoying. It sounds like it should be an exact science, but it's not. It feels like like a dark art, like I'm performing witchcraft whenever I do it. And I haven't nailed how to do it properly. So here's what happened the very first time I tried to print that big box. My 3D printer shit the bed. It would go all right for a few passes in the first layer and then part of it would start bubbling up and then there's this hood that covers the fan that helps cool the part after it lays the plastic down. And if the plastic is raised ever so slightly, just again, a fraction of a millimeter above where it's supposed to be, that hood, that fan hood catches on it. And you hear this snapping from the other room where I'm printing, ah, what's going on? And I've had a, really, a few really severe cases where the plastic has bubbled up and warped and rippled so badly that as the stylus was moving by that lumpy part, it's snapped the hood completely off like screws and everything. So I'm on a couple of 3D printing forums and I would ask what, what's going on. To a fault, they would always say, oh, it's leveling, it's leveling. You just gotta get your leveling proper and then you'll be able to do it. Stuff will print no problem. And remember, there's a million different dials to tweak. So it's it's not just leveling. There's just, there's just all sorts of parameters. And I don't work very well with situations where the, I've got a million dials to twist. So I didn't know what to do. What I ended up doing, since this plastic wasn't adhering properly, wasn't sticking to the bed, I decreased the distance between the bed and the nozzle. Now the bed that ships with the printer I have, the Anycubic Mega Zero, the bed itself is sort of rubber padding. And then you have this sort of rubbery, flexible magnetic plate that goes on top of that and it attaches. And when you're ready to take your part off, you pull off that plate and the idea is you flex and twist it and peel that piece off. And it's supposed to come off, no problem. If it doesn't, maybe you can scrape it with a little putty knife or something and get it off. While I was printing an insert for a future episode of Bits Please, using black PLA, I tried gingerly, carefully, it was, the part was sticking pretty tightly, and I tried to peel it off, and it ripped a strip of the magnetic bed off with it. I thought, oh my God, and the printer was like a week past warranty, and it's, I've already dug a whole divot in, in my, my magnetic bed. So I thought, oh man, what am I gonna do? I really worried that any future models I was gonna to try to print on this bed would, would mess up because I mean, that divot in there is, is at least a millimeter thick, maybe a fraction of a millimeter, but that matters with 3D printers. So I wrote to Anycubic and said, look, I've, you know, I've had it just a week past warranty now and I wrecked the bed, can you help me out? And they responded to my ticket and they said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll send you a new bed. The other thing I kind of want you to notice with this one is I've got some black, really thin PLA at the top of it. If I sort of shine the light on it the right way, you can kind of see black shapes from when I was printing out another insert for a different game. And that plastic, I can't get off. That's like glued there and there's no way. People say, oh, you just clean your bed with some isopropyl alcohol or whatever. There is no amount of isopropyl alcohol that will get that plastic off this bed. So I don't know what people are talking about. So here I am waiting for another bed and I'm going mad because I'm trying to make these videos for you to enjoy and I don't have a printer bed to print on. So I hit the forums and they said, oh, don't mess around with those magnetic beds. What are you doing? Those are junk and everybody knows it. So what you got to do is you got to get yourself a, you got to get yourself a glass bed. That's what all the pros are doing. They're using glass beds. So I hit Amazon and I bought a glass bed. And then I had to re-level the printer and I got it so that the paper would pull, but it wouldn't push. And so I thought I had done it all correctly and I adjusted the temperature according to the manufacturer spec who made the PLA. And off I went trying to print another one of these boxes for this insert. And then this happened. Oh my God, if you compare it to the magnetic bed, it's about like the same area, same size, same length that it just stuck too hard to the bed and it, it pulled that treated coating on the glass bed like clean off. And the whole thing about these glass beds, it was I, I, I was told that the coating was such that when it started cooling down, it would release your print and, and you could just go bloop and pop your print right, out, right off and it would be no problem. Uh, not the case. So I get kind of, uh, 
annoyed when I'm on online forums and people recommend things and they super don't work out. So I hit the forums again and said, hey, look, bozos. I went with the glass bed that you all recommended and it, it, it ripped a strip right off it. And they're like, glass bed? Oh my God, who uses glass beds anymore? No, 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 why mess around with that? You gotta get yourself a PEI bed. I forget what PEI stands for, but it's like a spring steel flexible, it's a metal bed that has a, depending on the bed you get, it's got a, a metal, sort of almost sandpapery kind of texture to it. And so they were saying, oh, you get one of the, you get a PEI, but don't mess around with the glass. Whoever told you to get glass? So I processed a return through Amazon on the glass bed that the PLA had ripped a chunk out of. And the replacement magnetic bed from Anycubic was on its way to my house. So I just kind of like hung out a couple days, still trying, I used the reverse side of the glass bed because people were saying the side that isn't treated is actually better for printing on. And I had a couple of successes on there, but it was still sticking pretty hard to that glass bed. It's pretty hard to get off. And then finally this replacement magnetic bed from Anycubic arrived and I thought, okay, I will keep working on the Anycubic magnetic bed. Meanwhile, I'll order a metal PEI bed and hopefully that'll arrive uh, soon. So off I went and I tried to print another box on the replacement magnetic bed. And I think the second or third thing that I printed on it, again, was stuck fast. I used a putty knife. I used a craft knife very, very carefully. I tried twisting it. I tried flexing the magnetic bed. I couldn't get this thing off. So I hit forums again and websites and they said, oh, you can, you can run it under hot water because that'll create a, a temperature differential and that didn't work. And another thing said, oh, you can put it in the freezer and then it'll freeze the plastic and then you heat up the magnetic bed underneath it and then that temperature differential will make it release it. And it just wasn't going. And I thought, oh my God, there's no way I'm gonna get this thing off. So I started kind of like using, I think I used it like a chisel to try to pop it off and I just wasn't getting between the magnetic bed and the PLA. It was like it was glued to the magnetic bed. Finally, I just threw up my hands and I realized there was no gentle way that this piece was coming off my replacement magnetic bed. And I just took a kitchen knife and I started hacking and slashing away like it was in an 80s horror movie. And finally, with one terrible swipe of my machete, I sliced through the magnetic bed and I felt awful for it, but the more I kept cutting and I peeled it away, the more I realized I didn't stand a chance because this is what happened. Here is the piece where I pulled off that chunk of plastic. It ripped, it was like Hannibal Lecter tearing that guy's face off. Like the, it, it, there was no way, no possible method that I could have used to get that off without severely damaging that bed. And here I was with a second, Sorry, this is the third bed now. My body count had reached three. I had ruined a third bed and production ground to a halt. But I knew I still needed to make this video for you. The PEI bed was on its way to my house on a slow boat from China and I was getting pretty impatient. So I hit Amazon again and I ordered this one, this PEI bed, which had the advantage of being double-sided. One of the sides had that rough texture on it and the other side had a smooth texture, both sides PLA. And that's an advantage that I didn't get from the bed that I ordered from this Wham Bam company over in China. Both of the sides of that PLA bed were gonna be rough. So I really like the idea that I would have now the option. And if I screwed up the PLA bed that arrived with both sides, which is a pretty highly likely possibility at this point, then I would have the other PLA bed as a backup. And if I wrecked that one too, I'd go jump off a bridge, I don't even know. So when the PLA bed arrived, I went and I you know, pulled off the busted old magnetic bed and I threw down the PLA bed and I re-leveled it and I was really excited. I thought this time for sure, I'm gonna print that big box and it's gonna work. And I printed that big box and it didn't work. This is how the box turned out. You can tell that in the first, I mean, this would have been like 10 hours of the print. The bottom had that slanty problem where the whole thing was leaning to the side. It's not until it got to this part that I thought, oh, I think I'll go straight now. Brrr, and it did the rest of the box completely straight. And so I thought, okay, maybe I can stick this in here and this will work. So these are two of the pieces that are supposed to go in the big box. So you stick this in here and it goes down fine until it hits the angly part. And then it's a little bit of a, a dicey fit. I don't even want to put it in there, in there because I don't want to get it stuck uh, irretrievably. And then we'll put this in here. And it's the same thing. It hits that sort of slanty part and there's no way that I can get in. It's gotta be a box. So that was a complete bust. And I 
figured out why it did that. It's because the magnetic, the ferrous padding underneath the magnetic bed that ships with the printer, I think is a little bit weaker. It's strong enough to hold on to that magnetic bed. It's not strong enough to hold on to the PLA bed. The PLA bed comes with its own 3M ferrous spongy pad. And so I hadn't used that. So when it got to a certain part of the print, it shifted. That stupid little hood protecting the fan just nicked kind of a too high part of the print and the whole bed got dragged over. And I gave it another whirl and sort of a similar thing happened. So you can kind of see it happening here. Look down here, you can see where the stylus went outside the bounds of the rectangle that it was trying to print. And that's because the bed had shifted. And I thought, oh, Ryan, you dummy, what you were supposed to do was use the ferrous pad that came with the, P, with the PEI bed and, st and stick it on. So I did that. I ripped the old one off and I put the new strong, presumably stronger ferrous bed uh, that's supposed to uh, magnetize the spring steel pad. And with that all in place, I once again tried printing the gigantic box for the insert. <laughs> and look, friends, we finally did it. Oh, and I'm just noticing as I take the uh, the box in hand that it's got a little bit of a here I'll show you it's got a little bit of a split on the corner there that you know with all the problems I've experienced here that's no problem I'll just zap that with some crazy glue throw a book on it it'll be fine it'll be fine because this box doesn't actually have to leave the bigger box at all it just sits in there and holds other things so check this out you know I'm gonna I've got all all the other boxes in there and I'm gonna slide this puppy home Woo. oh beautiful it fits gorgeously now you'll notice that none of the turned up corners on these towel holders matter a whit like they can just sit in there i can take them out there there's one of the turned up corners right there doesn't matter doesn't affect anything so i'm super happy so the remaining two boxes that go in this corner in this corner i already printed one of them that was the 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 one that ripped off the huge chunk in my bed and the other one was just this uh, narrow box and it was supposed to hold the shields. The shields, by the way, are these things. Your meeples in the game are supposed to be secret. So they provide you these shields and you fold them in like this. There's little slots here, a little slot here and a little slot here. So you just sort of fold it here, but that's gonna come apart at the seams, right? So they give you little paper chimney pieces as locks to drop into a slot there just to hold that that piece open so that the side flap doesn't come apart then you got your little shield you can keep your meatballs absolutely secret while you're playing which is pretty important to the game so the designer says in the notes that uh yeah these shields don't quite fit in that box in the corner so uh so i cut mine down to fit in the box and it's no big in fact i like them shorter and i was just like are you absolutely out of your mind. I'm not cutting any of my board game components to fit into a custom insert box. That's nuts. That's madness. I'm happy. I mean, I'm happy just to let these sit with all the other flat stuff on top. You know, the, the, the rule books, that's, that's fine. Why would I want to, why would I want to cut them? But then it got me thinking like, uh, now I'm going to have this big hole in the corner of my insert and the corner of my box. Is there something better I can do with that? Now, Thingiverse is the kind of place where people can remix other people's creations. Everything is up there is offered for free, and you can just take something and modify it and, and throw it back up there, give credit to the original designer and saying, look, I made it, yeah, I made it just a little bit better. So in that spirit, I thought I could make this insert just a little bit better. How am I gonna do that? Well, check out this remix by designer Paprika Dash. So Paprika Dash notes that you can get a bunch of different promo tiles for Key Flower, and I own, I think I own all of them. Uh, one's called Key Celeste, and one's called Key Melican, and then there's a, there's a Sorcerer tile. And these tiles are either one or two tiles as little promo expansion things, or sometimes they come with a little meeple. So the change, the innovation that Paprika Dash made was to modify the box that holds the green meeples and to sort of widen that smaller compartment so that it can hold the, the meeples that come with Key Celeste and with Key Melican. And then he, presumably, that's a he because, you know, board games plus statistics, thought, oh, okay, instead of making such rigid holders for the tiles, like maybe you get these promo tiles and now suddenly you can't fit everything in these boxes because it's a pretty tight fit. So he thought, I'm gonna make one big long box and treat it more like a card game where you can have dividers, movable dividers along the box and then stick your tiles in however you want, which is, yeah, I mean, that's a neat idea 
I wasn't a huge fan of his implementation. I didn't think it looked nearly as nice as the painted boxes for the different seasons. And the last thing I'll note is that neither of these two designers, not Hybrid Tracer and not Paprika Dash, came up with a way to store these things, these little shield chimneys to keep the shields locked. There's no great place to put them and you kind of need a great place to put them, especially because they're so small and thin, they're easy to lose. I think I don't have all, what is it? 12 that came with the game, which is kind of a bummer. So I've already lost a couple. So I really want a way to keep these little things safe inside my insert. So I thought I could kill multiple birds with one stone and use that corner piece to design an area that could hold any number of future promo tiles, plus any number of meeples that might come with those future promo tiles, future and current, plus a little caddy to hold all the little chimney pieces so I don't have to stick them in a baggie or risk losing them inside the box somewhere. So off I went to Blender, and it was nice because I could borrow elements from the existing design already. So I knew how big to make it because I had that big empty box that was supposed to hold your insanely scissored down player screens. And I had this sort of scoopy bowl shape that I was able to steal from the compartments that hold your meeples and other wooden resources. And I had the shape that's the perfect fit for holding all the hexagonal tiles from all the little season boxes. The only thing I really had to design was the little caddy to keep the chimneys in place. So that's what I came up with. But instead of spending the X multiple hours to print this entire thing out and then to find out that I've made a mistake, this was the piece that I was worried about most, the little caddy for the chimneys, because I knew the other stuff would work. I'd seen it work already in the existing insert. So what I did was I just sort of carved that one little piece out and printed it on its own. You know, j just as a test, and here it is. Looks like that, and I just wanted to see if I could fit the chimneys inside. And you can see from this little test run, it's a little, I mean, it's pretty snug. It's about the exact width of one of the chimney pieces. So that's the first sort of change I wanted to make, and it's an easy one. I just wanted to widen that little caddy up. I left a, a finger hole in here, so the idea is these chimneys are sort of like sitting in this caddy, and then you can just scoop them out with your finger like this. But notice, I got a big fat guy finger. So this little opening here is kind of like too big for my big stupid fat finger to fit in. So I'm already gonna be widening this. So obviously I need to widen this a little bit more to be able to get my finger in. And then just as far as the depth of the thing goes, I took all of the chimney pieces together and keep in mind I'm missing one or two. And look, the thickness is almost like as thick or thicker than, than what I've got there. So obviously I need to increase the dimensions that way too. So I'm really glad that I did the test run and I tried to find out you know, whether I had the dimensions on this thing correct or not. So the next step was to take this and print it in the larger piece, but I still wasn't keen on using all of my PLA to, to print that piece and you know, in a high quality, no infill solid piece like I've done everything else in the insert. So this was the result. You can kind of tell maybe, maybe even if I put it on the close-up cam that it's a little bit crusty crunchy uh, because I had, you know, I had infill turned on so you can see at the bottom of this basin you can see some of the infill in there. Maybe because the wall thickness isn't right or somebody online told me that it's a combing setting. So many settings to tweak. But this is how it's looking so far. And what I didn't piece together in my test because I only did it, you know, flat on the bed like this is that this piece the caddy for the chimneys, because it's suspended in midair, FDM printers don't handle that very well. So there was nothing to support it. So that's why the walls kind of didn't all print. It looks kind of crusty and chunky. It's because it needs support going all the way. Look at there, it's a nice fit for my finger now, right? I adjusted that beautifully. But it needs supports going all the way down to the bottom that you can just kind of like snap off later so that there's a foundation or platform for it to, to, to print that part on top of. So again, I made the right choice there to just do sort of like a rough, one of these chimneys stick into my finger, just to do like a rough cut test of, of what I designed. And here is what I'm calling the final piece. So I did do supports in here. It was a little dicey going at first. I was worried that it wasn't gonna be able to print this little platform, but it did, it printed it beautifully. And so now I can take my promo slash expansion tiles and stick them in this. They, they're a loose fit, of course, because I've deliberately left room for however many other promo slash expansion, expansion tiles they wanna come out with. I have no idea. Uh, I, I have a feeling that they're pretty much 
pretty much done with these, but it seems like every year or every couple of years they come out with a new one. So like, I guess as long as they keep selling, they keep making them. So that fits beautifully. And then there's this big well on the side, blah, 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 to put a couple of those expansion meeples in there for the different tiles. And then the caddy. Look at that, how beautiful is that? You got a nice little holder for those little chimneys. And it's beautiful. So then with that in place, the last piece I had to print was just a redo of that one that ripped off the chunk of my bed. And after I was finally able to get the big box printed properly, I felt pretty confident that I'll be able to get that one done too. Okay, so this is how we're looking with all the pieces printed. Let's call this like a, like a dry run, right? All the tiles are in there and the box, the custom box that I made, everything is fitting absolutely, just everything fits absolutely beautifully in the insert. I, my props to the designer, it's quite amazing. Except the one thing that I, I don't quite dig, I mean, I think these are ready for painting. I don't know because I haven't experimented with the paints. I don't know what it requires. Like, do I need to sand this stuff? Do I need to prime this stuff? On the subject of sanding, I think the answer is yes, because check this out. When I try to bring this piece of the insert out, it grinds a little bit against the edges. So, uh, it's not such a great noise. And then this one is even worse. Ooh, and that's just because the edge of the of the plastic is, you know, you get lininess, you get roughness. See right there, it's all those lines and they kind of act like grooves and they just provide a little bit of impedance. So that's just the teensiest pain just to get that stuff yeah, in and out. And if you'll recall, I believe this piece is supposed to be blue, so I will be spray painting a little bit, but I think I just want to sand down the edges before I do that. And then the seasonal towel holders up here, they're pretty good. They make kind of like a zipper noise. They're pretty good, but I still think I can smooth them down just a little bit. Just like with spray paint, I have no experience whatsoever with sanding. All I recall of sanding, this is why I didn't want to get an FDM printer to begin with, because Sanding in my brain takes absolutely forever. That's kind of all we did in shop class. We made one little project with some with some cut plexiglass and then we spent the next eight weeks sanding it. And it was just like the most tedious, awful thing in the world. My hands were tired. Anyway, I don't like the idea of sanding, but hopefully it won't be too bad with this stuff. And then with painting, I don't quite know what to do. I have a couple of products. I have, Rust-Oleum, like an automotive filler primer. And what that's supposed to do is it's supposed to prime the surface and use additional material to fill in any gaps. And then you sand that down, and it's supposed to provide a smoother surface. Of course, I could also try my thin Corax White Citadel primer that you've seen me use in, in past videos. That won't do anything about the grooves on the sides of the boxes. All that will really do, I think, is prime the surface for painting. Or I could just zap the surface with paint and see if the paint adheres well enough on its own without using any primer. That's a possibility. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the piece that ripped off the, the chunk of my bed, because that thing's useless, and I'm gonna try all three of those methods. Using techniques I learned from the mistakes I made in previous videos. There we go, sticky tack on the bottom of the thing, stick it to a piece of wood so you can turn it around. There's the filler primer, there's the Corax, there's the orange, zap, zap, zap. So here's that box and the results of my experiments. This was the side that I put two coats of the automotive filler primer on. And it filled it in quite nicely. I was pretty impressed with the job that it did. I, I scuffed that down a bit with some, I think, 150 grit sandpaper. Maybe it was a bit rougher than that. And yeah, it's nice, it's smoother. This is the side that had the Citadel primer on it. And I mean, it did nothing. It made it so maybe the paint could adhere, but it didn't fill in any cracks or make that smoothness any better. And that's with zero sanding. And this is the side where I just didn't prime, didn't sand, nothing. I just threw the spray paint on it. And that adhered really well. That's only one coat, so you can see maybe it needs another coat down there. But I think that looks pretty darn good. So I think all I need to do is smooth down the sides of the boxes so that they slide in and out of the insert a little bit better and then just zap them with a few coats of the paint and Bob's your uncle. All right, I think you know how the rest of this goes. Quick little soaky doke and scrubby dub water. That apparently helps the paint adhere to the plastic. Dry it off, little optional pat down just like at the airport. 
And here we go, spray paint time. Ugly side up, there's the blue, there's the orange. And we're doing the green. My spray paint technique still sucks. At least I'm holding the cans a little bit farther away from the pieces than I did in the uh, earlier videos. Then after the bottom coats are all done, wait about, I think, eight hours, and I did the second coat. Really, it's supposed to be a 24-hour dry, but I'm impatient. Here we go, top of everything. It's hard to get inside those boxes, lots of little corners. And then here, the paint was kind of like dripping. I thought I could fix it maybe to correct the pooling by using a paper towel. But seconds after I turned the camera off, I knocked the thing off its pedestal and it fell in a big pile of sawdust. So don't, uh, don't do that, just leave well enough alone. There's a last coat of yellow and the pink. This is how you stop sucking at something. You just suck at it a whole lot until you don't. That piece is really tough. I think I'm going to have to do another coat after the video is done. And these are the final ones with brown. Here we go, the big reveal. This is everything inside the box. And you can see we've got a little bit of box of maybe a quarter of an inch. And no, that's not because I didn't cut my shields down with scissors and lay them on top. Those aren't even a quarter of an inch thick. So if you don't mind box lift, we're fine. It's not a perfect fit. I'm not burned about it. <laughs> Woo, box fartometer. Four, my goodness, Whew, come on box. And it does smell like spray paint. My spray paint box, by the way, looks like a unicorn threw up in it. Here it is, all the shields on top, the instructions, and I think this is adding a little bit of thickness, these promo things. Anyway, yeah, look at it, oh my gosh! <laughs> it's so pretty, it's so pretty, and it looks exactly like the picture, you guys. Oh my gosh, I'll leave that in there, but you can see, I sanded down the edges. Stuff comes out beautifully. There's stuff for the insert, sorry, the expansion, the merchants. Bang, look at that compared to last time. And then, ooh, tiny bit of rubbing, but that is the action. The action on that is impeccable. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but look, ah, look, we did it. <laughs> we did it. I, I did it, you watched, but you watched a lot. That was a inappropriately long video. I hope you skipped ahead to this part anyway, using the chapters feature. I am going to take the, the, the boxes that I split up and I'm gonna put them on Thingiverse for you to download in case that you have a small printer build volume like I do and you wanna print this thing. And I will also make this custom box that fits the chimneys and your promos a bit more nicely uh, available. The one nitpick that I'll make is about this box right here for the farmers. The designer doesn't have the measurements quite accurate, so it fits all of the, the tiles, but they don't fit in spring, summer, winter, fall, turn order boat properly. It's like one tile off, so they're not arranged in the right order. I think I'm gonna redesign that for you, and I'll have that up in the same remix on Thingiverse. I would like to know from you, whether you thought this was all worth it or a gigantic waste of time and money, both yours and mine. Let me know down in the comments if you would print something like this, if you're interested in seeing more inserts being printed in this series. Uh, that's what the comments are for and I can't wait to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching this episode and I'll catch you in the next episode of Bits Please. Bits Please! Did you just watch that whole thing? Oh, hey, to 100% this video, click the badge to subscribe, and then click the bell to get notifications when I've got new stuff.